So I'll, I'll kick off with a couple, but if anyone has any, uh, please do stick your hand up and I'll try and uh, keep an eye out for them. Thank you everyone for your contribution. So I'd like to just, just kind of start off with one. Um, so we've, we've seen a few ideas and solutions about how we might uh, actually improve the experience of users. So we talked about Lean, we talked about AMP, um, to, and even just generally uh, making our sites better and, and trying to remove uh, any malware and that kind of stuff. Do you think if all publishers in this room um, adopted Lean and, and adopted AMP and that kind of stuff, do you think it would actually move the needle on, on ad blocking or is ad blocking inevitable? Um, can I go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, um, I think there's a very interesting thing about ad blocking that you know we need to bear in mind. It's this uh, tragedy of the commons effect, right? Which is basically so long as there's uh, bad websites out there who'll make go for the short-term gain, they basically externalize those costs, right? They're betraying the common goodwill of our audience, uh, but they don't feel the effects. They just you know get that higher CPM for putting an autoplay video ad and a popover with a countdown, right? And we all suffer, right? So, so long as there's any bad actors, it continues to get worse. Another like, example I think it's gonna be very difficult for the industry to deal with is the fact that video ads are part of the problem. So are we going to, maybe we can go to skippable, right? 15 seconds, my feeling is still too long, yeah. right? People are going to continue to, to install ad block because they can, you know? And uh, we have to think about the future where you know, I don't think we'll ever get to 100%, but having an ad blocker in your browser, it might just end up being kind of like having a, a firewall on your PC. Right? It doesn't mean we have to get rid of all kinds of ads, but they will be very effective at getting rid of the ones that could potentially, well, frustrate the user or maybe even damage the user's privacy or security. The, 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 the cat's out of the bag now, isn't it, really? If, if on Dennis's websites we took off all advertising apart from one MPU, our ad block rate would still be the same. We're being pressured and we're spending money on services like the Media Trust to clean up the ecosystem of ads that, that we're having served. The ad block rate will still say the same. The, the, the problem's there. We have to sort, sort out the solution and talk to the user, which is why I think a, a, a lot of sites and a lot of publishers need, need to have that engagement. If, you're, if your whole business revolves around some B2B data, for example, let, let the user in, but ask for their email address and the company that they work at. You know, and obviously find a way to, to, to validate that. If they're after a car, find an alternate solution to, to, to monetize them. The, the ad experiences on us as uh, on premium publishers uh, is a million percent better than an illegal stream website or an adult website or whatever you want to class. There is nothing we can really do now apart from speak to the users who want our content that costs millions of pounds to make um, to basically educate them to, to, to that fact and then let, let them in. So, so we've heard about you know, talking to the users and listening to what the users want, but I'm just going to throw, throw a devil's advocate question out there now. Um, is there any downside for publishers block, just blocking users who don't see ads, given they don't get any money for them? What's the downside? I think there's a massive lost opportunity. I think this is probably the most valuable segment on everyone's website. And to, so if you take a, a typical hard block wall, um, a premium publisher uh, will get maybe a 40% uh, success rate with that, in, and that's a good result according to a lot of people. And it, it sure is a lot more than zero, but the other 60% are leaving for good. I mean, that's just leaving a lot of money on the table. Yeah. Right, so I think that's the cost. You've got to think about the future of a blocked web. It's just going to be more ad blocking in the future, uh, especially uh, presuming that mobile happens. We've got to think about how to you know, live in that future rather than just block, the block the users. Yeah, I think the answer also depends on sort of how much unique your content is. Right? I mean, thinking from a user's perspective, that would it make a difference if one publisher blocked the content for me? As long as the content was available somewhere else, I would just go there, right? So I think I mean, that's part of the tragedy of the commons problem as well. So unless the sort of response is uh, coordinated across, uh, one publisher just taking a hard wall approach is, not, is actually going to be self-detrimental in the short term, if anything else. So that's something French yeah. publishers did, as I as understand. Yeah, and, and Swedish as well. Uh, so they had 22 out of the 25. Um, Top, top tier publishers uh, actually form a, a, a collective and start missing users. But we've got the BBC in this country, haven't we? So if, if all our news sites, uh, we start blocking, blocking users, that the BBC will always be uh, showing, showing um, news to users without, without adverts. But, but I think even if, even if that approach were to be taken, I mean, again, as a user, you would feel that's more sort of as a cartel blocking me and, and acting against me, rather than trying to listen to me or solve the problem. And mm -hmm. I think that sort of then beats the 
the, the thing mm. that I talked about that we really need to listen and make them part of the solution here. Yeah. Uh, so there are steps we would need to take and there are steps they should need to take. Practically speaking, we have to remember as well in France and in Sweden, every single publisher had to individually reconvince every user. Right? Just because of how Adblock works, there isn't a button they could press to whitelist all the French websites in one go. Mm -hmm. So practically, it's, it's very difficult to scale that approach. Any questions from the uh, audience at this point? Over there. Um, Mike Conn's <laughs> way. <coughs> Do you want to say your name and uh, who you work for? Be useful. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Julia Deer from uh, Haymarket. Um, we've talked a lot about the value exchange between publishers and consumers. What about the value exchange between advertisers and publishers? Because surely, if advertisers gave us proper pricing based on correct attribution and ROI tracking, we wouldn't be forced to put so many ads on a page in such high impact formats, and therefore we could do a better job for consumers. So it's kind of a question really for to Steve. There's no advertisers or agencies on the stage, um, and I just wondered what you guys are doing to push back at advertisers and agencies for their part in this and for what they need to do to start the uh, fair value exchange for everybody. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, we are working with Group M as part of the coalition. You saw the Omnicom group. We're also on there as well as Unilever and PNG. Clearly, that needs to be many more parties involved in that, but it's a good starting point. Um, and the numbers, the economics have got to work because it's all well and good us talking about non intrusive advertising. But as you said, you rightly said, it's based on KPIs which are thought to determine brand engagements or return on investment. So it may require some shift in terms of perception around measurements. I think there's already a lot of work being undertaken around attribution and changing perception around correct attribution and what it means. And also being honest about the fact that you can't attribute 100% of all sales traffic um, accordingly. You know, it, there are gaps in digital, there will be. We're going to have to make some jumps, some guesstimates based on what we can measure. And I think we as an industry need to be honest about that. Not everything can be attributable. There's going to have to be some form of bundling. Um, but I think Group M, uh, Omnicom and others are very open to that discussion. Um, and, and they're not thinking about it in a very binary way. I know from a trading perspective, it can often be very black and white. But I think the good news about the coalition is it's people thinking about it differently and saying, actually, what does it mean? Because actually, if, if intrusive advertising works, you wouldn't see the, upcreate, uh, the, the increase in ad blocking. And if we carry on as we're currently doing and determining click-through rate and other very poor measures to be examples of better engagement, we're going to see that ad blocking rate increasing. So it's not in either brands or agencies representing their interest to continue with that. So they realize that there, there needs to be some form of change. And that means changing in modeling. And that discussion is being had. So it's not, you know, the, the coalition is not thinking just in isolation about better formats. It's around measurement, and it is around changing how we think about digital advertising. But I can't give you any assurances that on a front line it means that you know, CPMs are going to increase accordingly. But we are continuing to have that conversation. Any more questions? One over here. Um, <clears throat> mic's on its way. My mic isn't working. Hello, Nick Strick. Nick Stringer, public policy consultant, used to work at um, the IB with Steve. Um, this is a question for Simon because he was looking a bit lonely up there. Um, uh, regulators and, and industry are miles apart in their language, in, and I don't include Elizabeth Denham in that, by the way. Um, and soon she'll be sitting outside of the European Union anyway um, as a regulator. Uh, and uh, is there a danger that with the GDPR, not necessarily with the GDPR, but with the revised e-privacy directive, that we end up with what was a, a, a well-intentioned piece of legislation that's difficult to work in practice that doesn't address any of these issues at all? What? Do you want this one? I, I think... The, the proposed solution of looking at regulating an outcome is welcome, uh, rather than regulating the technology that achieves an outcome. So I think that generally is good news. Um, what is less good news is the amount of um, involvement there's going to have to be 
uh, amongst all stakeholders in this ecosystem to be able to comply with those rules. I mean, if you're looking at the issue of transparency, how do you uh, achieve that high watermark of being transparent when we have a current ecosystem that is anything but? Uh, and I think there's some good work being done on uh, the transparency of the ecosystem, but there's still a lot more to do, and, it, and it's confusing for people. Um, it addresses it in the sense of it says what you have to tell your users. Um, the problem is that as a publisher, you probably haven't got all of that information. Uh, and as someone said earlier, the difficulty is, is that it's the publishers who are being put in the position of having to promote compliance. I mean, if you actually look at the e-privacy directive, that's really very clear. It should be the intermediaries who are actually obtaining the consents and being transparent and the like. But as a fudge, it was pushed on to the publisher because of the lack of connection between the user and the intermediary. Um, and I think that has to change. It's a very difficult issue. How do you change that? How do you have more engagement between the user and that ecosystem of intermediaries? rather than just pushing everything onto the publisher, because that, that's where we currently are. It's the publisher who has to provide the information relating to transparency, but of course the publisher hasn't got all of that information, because it's being withheld by the stakeholders who sit in the middle. Can I run with the point? Yeah, for we've, we've tried to, because we think we're, we're reinventing ads for the blocked web, <laughs> tried to get ahead of this, and imagine Right, so, so one of the problems is there's so many companies cooperating and serving the ads that the challenge of even being transparent, so the user has the right to object, for example, involves like figuring out who's going to get access to, that, to personal data from the user, who's planting a pixel, who's doing a cookie sync, and what different purposes they're using that data for. And each of those should require uh, consent from the user. So if there's a DMP, Every purpose the DMP uses that data for in the future needs to be individually consented to. As a, as a consumer privacy advocate, which I used to be kind of in my postgrad work, I love that, and I think it, it's the right direction. But right now, our problems start way before how to do it to de with, deal with the GDPR. It's just how to understand how our ads get to the page and who's running off with the user data while that's happening. Um, so it's very hard to actually even, we need to start right there. I mean, ghostery is terrifying. <laughs> there is a challenge there, though, because um, you know, users talk about wanting relevant advertising and yet also talk about not wanting to be tracked. Um, there's a great, great quote, I can't remember who said it, which was, um, users love, uh, sorry, users hate advertising in general, but love advertising specifically. Um, and it's very hard to do that when you've got that mix. Do, do you think that um, lean uh, might be considered uh, to be kind of industry self-regulation? Could that, could that be something, or even amp, amp ads, potentially? By the, by the regulators? I, I think it's all useful, but there are so many different things you could talk about in, in relation to this debate. So, relevancy um, of the ad. You know, we're talk we, we spent a lot of time today talking about the intrusiveness of the ad, and particularly video ads. Um, but relevancy is still an issue. Um, the, the difficulty is that the regulators are, are, are regulating that area as well, because the challenge uh, is to come up with relevant advertising, but in order to do that, you need more data, and you need more insights into that data. So how do you persuade people to be more comfortable about handing over their data <coughs> in order that you can actually get better relevancy in a world where, uh, essentially, where they are now is they would say that a lot of advertising that is served up to them isn't relevant, and, it, and it's not gonna make any difference if I give people more of my data. I mean, we need to change that perception that the user has, that if you do give us the opportunity to look a little bit deeper into who you are and why you do what you do, we can provide more relevant content. So, so Nick and Sean, you've been at the cold place really trying to get uh, ad recovery working and uh, obviously one just on Dennis and then for more publishers. Um, we, there's a bit of a theme today about uh, restrictions, really, that, that Lean is putting restrictions on the kind of ads. It's all, all thinking about the user, really. Obviously, AMP is putting technical restrictions, which benefits the user. What restrictions are, are there around ad recovery? Uh, is it, is it uh, 
perfect, or, or is there lots of technical challenges? Uh, de de definitely far from perfect, uh, and I, I think a lot of that is borne by by the uh, the amount of tracking scripts and, and cookies that the agencies and clients demand of creative. I mean, honestly, uh, this is n n not a lie. I think uh, three or four months ago, uh, Dennis, someone sent us a 10 meg flash file. Still, you know, that is still happening from top tier creative agencies. And I wonder why, because they probably get paid £100,000 to, to build a set of creative. There's a, there's a bigger problem that, that, that needs to be solved there. You know, if you run JPEGs or GIFs as, as backups, yeah, people are going to click on them. On the ads we've recovered so far from our um, programmatic sources and client direct sources, uh, you know, users are, are, are clicking the ads, but they take longer to serve because they have to go through different processes. Uh, and technically, from a, a latency perspective, you're, you're going to get uh, uh, just a bigger, bigger issue, regardless if you're serving five ads or, or one. There's a whole new set of, of complications in terms of tracking and, and delivery that, that are exposed. I can, I can kind of objectively or try to objectively compare the different kinds of comp competitors we have, what the landscape is in terms of delivering to ad blockers. And uh, it's, there's a, a spectrum, I suppose. Um, just, you know, Are you in terms able to of the, the kind of the, the initial creative, or is it in terms of restrictions on the creative? Yeah. So, um, from our perspective, we're at one end of the spectrum where we, we we say we'll only deal with stuff that we know is completely defensible from ad blocking, and that pretty much puts us in the territory of JPEGs and GIFs at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, good news is we can normally work. We can get, we can find those in creatives. Creatives still have backups, or we can convert creatives dynamically. Um, but there is a lot of restrictions there. Right? Um, rich media isn't something we really do right now. On the other end of the spectrum, other competitors that we have are basically uh, transcoding the creative with all of the JavaScript and putting, putting it into the page, um, which certainly works at the outset, but from our point of view, is inevitably going to lead to uh, back and forth warfare with Adblock as they go deeper into the creative to try and hide aspects of it. Um, which is a game we've just strategically decided not to play mm -hmm. as a, from one point of view, a resource question. Um, so I think that there's going to always be trade-offs there mm -hmm. on the creative. But you have this thing in your pocket to play with, which is these users live in an uncluttered web. It's like we've gone back 20 years, and we don't need to start with rich media, auto-expanding things. Mm -hmm. Simple ads work again. And we don't need to escalate the situation against ourselves. So one, one thing we haven't actually talked about today is, is acceptable ads. Um, so you know, IEO, the, the make guys who make um, Adblock Plus, they have an acceptable ads program. Other, other ad blockers do as well. Um, some have argued that AMP is kind of an open source um, acceptable ads by, by having the community define what is an acceptable ad. Um, what's, what's changed recently is um, IEO are talking about doing their own ad network. You've got um, a browser called Brave, which has got ad blocking built in, which again is, is serving acceptable ads. What do, what do you think about that, um, Nick, as from a publisher perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for, for those that have seen the uh, addendum to uh, an IO contract and seen actually what they class as acceptable uh, is up for debate, obviously. Um, but they, they, still, they still have a, a program to grow their user base. They are a commercial organization, and they need to make revenue. So if you look at the, the current install base, and I, I think Steve put, put the graph up earlier, you know, two to 300 million worldwide active users, it's in their best interest, isn't it, to, to become 500, to become 700, to become a billion active user install base. Uh, and then that's, that's going to be game changing, isn't it? So it's, it's converse, isn't it, that as uh, an organization that at, at one point stands up for the user and then wants to monetize that same user on our site, not even their site, or has any say in it, is, is, is a kick in the teeth, really, especially when for years they stood up for the fact that they were there to protect the user on stages like this. Uh, and then all of a sudden, as they need to start to monetize their, their, their platform, uh, the, the game changes. So um, we, we shall see. But um, I, I know for one, uh, as things currently stand, you know, Dennis will, will not be an engaged in, in, in anything like that. It's a definition of a definition of a shakedown. Yeah. I mean, there's two ways around it. You follow the money, right? Any participation, if you're basically, if they can make any money out of you, uh, enough money to justify billing you, they will, and that money goes back into the development of ad blocking, right? That's <clears throat> that cycle. I think for me is what makes it puts it in the category of uh, something potentially extortionate. And it's, uh, but there is a few interesting things to take away from it, which is the largest ad blocker in the world, uh, Adblock Plus, they're now teamed up with their, their sec second place rival, Adblock. That's about 90% of desktop ad blocking out there. 
Um, they're responsible for showing ads to ad blockers. Most of the ads that ad block users out there see are, from, are facilitated by their own ad blocker. So in many ways, they completely uh, make it acceptable to <laughs> show ads to ad blockers because they're, they're, they're the guys who do most of it. I think that, that, I mean, the, the big particular addition here is to the, like the entity and their history and what they're doing. But I think if you take it to the concept level, I think that's what Lean and Coalition for Better Ads would need to do anyway. I think, the, I mean, yes, it's a practically very difficult problem to solve, but conceptually it is about saying, let's define what is good and acceptable with some, some level of agreement. Uh, let's make it easy to implement the good thing. Let's make it difficult to implement the bad thing. And let's involve the user and give them the choice. Right? Those are the sort of, the, roughly speaking, the four elements kind of aligned to what the four working committees around lean and things would be. So that concept still stands. I think it is us getting together and working. It will be a difficult, arduous sort of step-by-step -step journey. Uh, but if those four things would need to be done is my view of things. I don't know. Nick, what do you feel? Yeah, no, no, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I, I'm you know, <coughs> willing to sort of vilify the many do. You know, there is, it's, there's an opportunity in the market. You know, ad blocking has become somewhat of a kind of cottage industry, you know, of people based in regard, but regardless of your motivations, and I think in some cases their, their motivation for the documents is being entirely self serving, and others, when you meet them, they have a very ideological approach. But regardless of, of what you believe and what you don't, if you're taking money out of the system and actually profiteering from it, it compromises your ability to be a sort of neutral party. So I think in that sense, we've, the IB, as has the AAP, IPA, and ISBA have all declined joining their, their, their acceptable ads committee, which is their next generation of saying the industry needs to define what these acceptable ads are to show to IA, IA users, Adblock Plus users, um, because they still take money, for, you know, they still take money from it. They'll still take the 30% of incremental revenues from those that are in the room that are defined as large publishers. And we see that as a challenge. You know, if they were a not-for-profit, maybe in Mozilla, it may be, it would still be challenging, don't get me wrong, but if you're a profit-making business, it makes it challenging. But regardless, they, they have 100 million users with their alliance with our Block Plus, our Block, rather. Um, so we are, you know, we are discussing uh, and, and sort of chatting with them to try and find out what their goals are. I think they would argue that their release at Mexico is an extension so rather, of what they already do. So rather than having to do manual um, evaluation of publishers, they have a programmatic solution which can then auto automatically actually look at a website and say, does it comply to their acceptable words policy? Um, but we don't think it's right that they define it in isolation, even with this kind of new acceptable words committee and you know, IB and AAP have chosen not to be on that because of that compromise. Um, and just addressing the last point, I don't think Lean's not there to restrict and say to the market, you can't do this. It's based on saying this is what consumers who block are willing to accept and what they're not. And actually just putting pointers in place that we need to get a little bit better, a little bit stricter on our own self-regulation because we know that clearly that what we have in place isn't working for all consumers. They're switching off. So we need to get a little bit harder and actually be a bit better about actually saying, you know, strike that off the list rather than just saying, well, this is... You know, pop-ups are not advised, actually just saying, let's get rid of pop-ups, for instance. We know people don't like them, but we know short-term monetary gains determined by short-term goals in terms of metrics are driving that. So let's have a conversation and shaking it up. But it has to compare favorably against other media when it comes down to it. And if, you know, new forms of advertising, we have to get buyers to invest in that because if less intrusive means better, a better consumer experience, it could mean, again, a bit more favorable view of brands and better brand uplift. It's going to take time for that, to, for that evidence to meet out. So we are asking people to make somewhat of a, of a sort of, um, to keep the faith, but we are working with buyers and everybody in the community as part of the coalition to try and bring everybody on that journey rather than just trying to stop you from just monetizing, actually trying to do a gradual change rather than sort of quick shift change and hopefully bring everybody on a, on a better journey, which means better advertising, better response, better CPMs. I'm going to finish with one, one last question. So uh, in about 2001, um, the pre prevalence of people using a pop-up blocker extension was about 25 20%, about the same as we're seeing AdBlock now and Sides of Plateau. And of course, um, uh, Google came out with, um, uh, actually had a, uh, had a pop-up blocker at the time, because when Chrome came out, it would block pop-ups by default. All the other browsers followed. Uh, we talked about the, the browsers in, in Asia um, that are bl uh, blocking ads by default. Do you think we might see a point where Chrome and, and other major browsers actually block ads by default, maybe with acceptable ads? Nathan, can you? Probably, <laughs> probably can't say or don't know, <laughs> yeah, but you exactly. know. <laughs> can't say or don't know, I think. It's definitely, I think the concept, yeah, I mean, it's not a too alien concept to think about, right? Uh, but again, I think the, 
from what I know about how Google's thinking, they, this is that is the four different angles of solving the problem. It's no one silver bullet solution, right? So it's not inconceivable, but is it happening or not? It's not something I can say right now. Anyone else think, take the chances on the likelihood? The regulators, the regulators. Mm. You can always have the yeah, yeah, no. no, yeah. yeah. The regulators' approach on this um, is interesting because um, the answer to that question all depends on whether you need explicit consent. Um, so if we end up in a world where we don't need explicit consent, then there's no requirement to have ad blocking on by default. Um, but if the regulator uh, some of the views being expressed are at the more extreme end, where they say, actually, it should be explicit consent, uh, implied consent isn't good enough, uh, then we would be in a world where these things are switched on by default, because the only way that you could really get explicit consent is to ask people to turn it off. Um, so th 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 there's an issue there around consent. And certainly, um, it, with regard to the e-privacy uh, review, what they want to see, the regulators who are leading that, is for consent there to be aligned with the consent rules in the GDPR, which are more focused on explicit consent rather than implied. Great. So we're going to have to uh, leave it there. We're running out of time, I'm afraid. Um, so we're breaking for lunch now. Uh, we, there is an opportunity to meet some of, um, some of the associates in the AOP, uh, so I think Seltra and um, Media Trust. Uh, is that in here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, over here, I think. I'm not sure. Um, I think at these stands here. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, if you'd like to uh, give a hand to our uh, speakers, please.